and then finally when we take these art, art students they graduate and wait about 3 years unemployed socially their prime life social um, distress and psychological impacts finally government comes during election time and say we will give you employment and like what we did last time 100000 were absorbed into government state sector where the state sector is already suffering overcrowded already suffering with, with uh, absolute uh, over employment so this is not going to answer we need to reform our higher education in order to build a proper economy in sri lanka see universities are having this dichotomy always they are funded by the state but they yearn to be independent from the state i have got reports that within the state universities in some universities in some faculties speaking english is banned you can't even use the name facebook whatsapp or youtube this is the first time that the sri lankan higher education system sri lankan universities were closed after 1988 and 1989 it is due to the covid pandemic and now slowly the sri lankan universities are being opened now dr suren raghavan when he took over as uh, the state minister very recently he said he had a herculean task minister when you took over the ministry of higher education how was it and what was the state it was the university system hmm. thank you lairu for having me and uh, i think uh, i'm privileged to have a, a chat with you the question that you raised and the forward that you gave for that had to be slightly corrected uh, university system in sri lanka had been closed prior to this period as well um 1971 insurgency time all the universities were closed for a long time uh and then of course as you mentioned 88 89 period again university based uh, uh, activist were there therefore universities were closed and that some, some universities were turned as uh, unfortunately some universities were turned as um, camps military camps and later we were told also as ch- torture chambers which is a dark passage of our history then in the north uh, due to the war a prolonged period of time the universities were not functioning properly if not closed so uh, but you are right uh, as um, the social pandemic situation did not allow us to meet people personally or gather which is the fundamental way of studying in universities the university the difference between university and other stuff mode of studies are that people who come together gather and debate discuss discourse disagree and then learn so that that collective learning was not possible due to absolute health reasons uh, nearly 2 years we were closed uh, but latter part of that closure uh, we were able to go online and then transfer the basic knowledge transferring activity took place but it of course lacked the essence the soul of university studying uh now we are back we just gave uh, the opportunity to all the vice chancellors 17 universities plus all the other higher education institutes we have five uh, 17 universities under ugc five universities under ministries nine postgraduate uh, institutes and 18 higher diploma and higher education institutes in sri lanka we gave all of them the freedom of uh reopening fully as they wish because we still have uh, some challenges with the transportation and fuel so that was uh, that is also partly my vision for universities and higher education centers to be completely free no see universities are having this dichotomy always they are funded by the state but they yearn to be independent from the state <laughs> so this uh, paradox um need to be a healthy paradox uh, actually it's a, a, a paradigmical paradox <laughs> it's a it's a paradox in a paradigm <laughs> uh, but how do we do that uh, is um, i think intellectual as well as social discourse uh, that is what we are trying to do uh, and that is what we just did uh, two weeks ago moving on 
you propose some reforms for the university system. What sort of reforms and what sort of changes do you plan to implement in the higher education system in Sri Lanka? Hmm. A good question, but a broader philosophical uh, question if you want. One can lecture about three hours on that. But Sri Lanka's uh, higher education, the modern higher education of Sri Lanka is a byproduct of the colonial rule. Our university, the oldest university is 100 years old, uh, University of Colombo um, was started. I mean, we had a university system prior to the colonial era based on our Piriveners and all that. But the modern university system came as a result of the colonial masters and their need. So what was their thinking during the colonial? Colonial master wanted, uh, for the English colonials who ruled our country, never thought that they would leave in 1948. They thought it's a prolonged and long stay here. So they wanted to have skilled minds. And that is why before universities, they created three colleges. Namely, the Technical College, which is in Maradana now, and Law College, which is also in uh, Maradana, and Medical College, right? Why is this? Because they thought they were the thinkers, they, would, they will do the planning, but we are skilled people who had to carry out. But later, um, the modernism, when modernism was hitting them, when enlightenment was taking hard roots in Europe, they realized that colonial colonial subjects also need to be uh, encouraged in that and they started universities. But still, those university systems had a grassroots level of colonial legacy in them. Now, in modern education systems are going through major debates because uh, present universities fall into two categories, Lahiru. One is the Hambetarian, Hambletarian universities, which started in the 16th, 15th century by William von Hambleton, a German philosopher, Enlightenment uh, beginning period. So they thought the role of universities were to work on human freedom, human liberation. So you, Lairu, come to university, work on your philosophy and give new theories of finding answers to human liberation because they thought science can provide all the answers that human society needs. Some universities are still operating that way. But after the civil war and independence of the US, the US thinkers said, no, we wouldn't go that path. The role of universities are to find answers to contemporary as well as possible future challenges that humanity will fa face. Therefore, you could see the difference. American universities produced more than 100 things that we are using today, including the cell that you are using, including the tab that I am using, internet, Xerox machine, fax machine, all the NASA science that came from American universities. So these are two philosophies. So we have kind of inherited the colonial legacy. But we are trying to go between these two directions. And our economy is demanding to be a more liberal education model, market oriented as would some would call. But our independence and independence struggles and the leftist thinking, Sri Lanka is, uh, you know, uh, it is socialist, democratic republic of Sri Lanka. So we have the socialist part that demands us to be still the Hambletarian university model. So my, your question, my reforms will be to find a, a possible path, path between because we invested uh, 89 billion rupees last year. With all these economic challenges, we have uh, invested that much in, uh, it is not enough. We must invest even double the amount. I am arguing more investment for higher education. But then we ask the question, are they really investments? How do we measure? So higher education must contribute to societal, anthropological, artistic, and also very strongly economic progress of that country, which can keep pumping more money into higher education. Unfortunately, Sri Lanka had failed in that level. We have, we take about four, roughly about 40,000 students for university higher studies. But that is only about 20% who are qualified and uh, nearly only 10% of who passes. That's a crime. You must give everyone 
uh, opportunity for higher education. But the most of the people that the students and the citizens who are coming to our universities, 17 universities, but last year, for instance, we have taken 8,000 art graduates, 5,000 management graduates, 3,000 engineering graduates, 2,500 medical students, and learning English as a second language. Just give me a figure. English had become the most important language on planet Earth, whether we like it or not. Even the French had agreed on that. But out of the 40,000 students we took, we took only 37 graduates education for English, learning English as a second language. So you can see there is a big mismatch between what we are doing. And then finally, when we take these art, art students, they graduate and wait about three years unemployed, socially, their prime life, social um, distress and psychological impacts. Finally, government comes during election time and say, we will give you employment. And like what we did last time, 100,000 were absorbed into government state sector. Where the state sector is already suffering, overcrowded, already suffering with, with uh, absolute um, overemployment. So this is not going to answer any of our problems. Therefore, we need, we have some uh, strategic plans, but uh, it is not just because IMF is telling us or World Bank is telling us, but it is because we need to reform our higher education in order to build a proper economy in Sri Lanka. So uh, within a short period, we will propose some other already proposed ones uh, in, a, in a more systematic manner. We will put it for public debate and debate with the intellectuals and bring in these reforms soon as possible so that it will be parallel to our economic reforms. Coming into English as a second language, so this is going to be a bit controversial because I've got reports that within the state universities, in some universities, in some faculties, speaking English is banned. You can't even use the name Facebook, WhatsApp or YouTube. They have their own, let's say, made up or maybe contemporary Sinhalese names for those or from their own native language. So the I'm interested to know what do they use the, for, for Facebook? <laughs> for Facebook, they use Amunapota. Amunapota. Ah, okay, for okay. WhatsApp, they use some bizarre name that I haven't heard of. <laughs> okay. for, uh, for YouTube, they use some butter. Nah. Butter or something, I don't know. <laughs> but it's being practiced. And, and It'll be obscene if it is uh, directly translated in Singhala. Yeah. <laughs> Umbe butter. <laughs> <laughs> so, my question is, why are some faculties, some student unions so against the language of English, which is a universal language? Mm. Why is that? And what would you do yeah. as the state minister of higher education mm. to uh, promote English as a language? Yeah, a very pertaining question. Uh, I believe um, whoever had succeeded in life in our time, would say that uh, learning English was crucial. I mean, my I studied in the Mahavidyalaya. Learning English, I went to night school because my father, due to political uh, activities, he was in prison for some time. So our family went through a very hard time. But I realized that learning English was a crucial uh, factor I had to do. So I went night, night classes while I was doing my ordinary level exams. And that edge, that English language edge gave me a, a, a step ahead of others and then I was able to win scholarships and then, you know, the rest, rest is history. So your question about why there is a anti-English sentiment, particularly in our highest education universities, are two factors. One is modern 17 universities and higher centers are absorbing students who have come from rural area. Unlike about 50 years ago, where the middle class came to, for instance, our president is the first president to come from a Sri Lankan university, particularly Columbia University, right? And uh, so if you ask him, uh, he was walking distance to University of Colombo, walking distance to his uh, college, Royal College, right? <laughs> and he obviously came from an elite family. So that was the time. I mean, our brilliant um, one of the students of Columbia University is Professor G.L. Pepys, and you find that his background. So about 50 years ago, 40 years ago, middle class people came to universities. At that time, English wasn't a major issue because it was their second language always. But now the situation is completely different. We have 
80 percent, 89, even I would say 90 percent of students who come are very rural, sub, not some are suburban, but even then English language is a big, you know, this whole thing called Kadua. We use it as Kadua. Why Kadua? That which cuts me, right? So there is this English language which separates from, even, I mean, even in Columbia University, there is English speaking canteen, which is called the Heaven. And the other, other part, uh, I don't know what they call now. So English speaking has happened as a socially segregation point. So those who can't enter that, they oppose it. So that's a basic social line. But of course, that's a history. Mr. Bandarnaika, who was a brilliant uh, scholar, I think personally, Bandarnaika is the only political philosopher in this country. And he went to Cambridge, uh, rather Oxford. And uh, in Oxford, he was the chair of the union, <laughs> president of the union, and did all what he, but he, when he came here, he, for political reason, he took this anti-English stand, or rather saying, we all must learn Sinhala, blah, blah, and where the, so that I think has still renowned. Um, but if you ask any modern person, any modern, I mean, Sinhala is only spoken in Sri Lanka. The 16 million people only speak Sinhala. It's an endangered language. Today, I think it is even endangered because uh, urbanites, media is not promoting proper Sinhala. So we must learn Sinhala. We must promote Sinhala. We must safeguard Sinhala. Unlike the Tamil language, which is our sister language, Tamil, 100 million Tamils are there all over. And the Tamil Nadu is promoting their language so much. But that kind of language promotion is not here. But that doesn't mean that you do not learn or you oppose learning Sinhala. That is actually going back to a black hole and tribalism. I would say everybody must learn English so that they know the value of Sinhala and so their Sinhala can improve further when they are connected with her. So what do we do? High education, we can't teach English because it's a, it's a school matter, but we need to produce with high salaries, English teachers. There was a time in Sri Lanka where Sri Lankans went to teach English to other Commonwealth countries. Now, the present Brunei king learned English under Sri Lankan. The present Oman uh, king or I don't know, Emir or whatever it's called, he is called. He learned English under Sri Lankan. So we had that legacy, but we have lost it. We need to regain, invest so much, of, pay high salaries, recruit English teachers, ask them to go to high schools, maybe an army of English teachers is necessary immediately. And that's exactly what Rajiv Gandhi did in 80s and 90s. And today you see that those kids who came out of that era are controlling the information world, whether it's Sudhar Pichai or those big names, you know. <laughs> so that's my, that will be my, my policy towards uh, learning English. Moving on to uh, student welfare, we know that uh, Mahapola, uh, established by um, late uh, Lalit Kundale, mm. is one of the key welfare programs for university students in Sri Lanka. And you might know a friend or two who buys a fried rice or has, throws a party from Mahapola as well. And there are other university students who are very much deserving of Mahapala, not receiving it, or either receiving partially, or let's say it's not enough. Minister, how would you look at Mahapala and how would you try to increase the welfare amount? Because now the Sri Lanka is facing an economic crisis and it's, the inflation is rising and some students are complaining that Mahapala is not enough. Yeah, that, that's, that's, I think, good that you ask for student welfare. Sri Lanka's social indication on higher uh, free education is very high in South Asia. Therefore, we have been able to uh, re reach a higher literacy rate comparatively to our income level. Uh, 4,500 uh, uh, mid-income, low, mid-lower income uh, category societies when you compare Sri Lanka is on a, but that's because uh, even the colonial masters onward, we invested on education. I mean, we, we heavily invested. I mean, I'm reminded every time about Kandangara's vision, CWW Kandangara's vision of uh, educating and education investment. But particularly, uh, late Mr. Lalit Athrath Mudali, 
we must remember remember him as a, as a person who had a vision because he uh, he was an oxfordian uh, ironically famous oxfordians have been killed in this country <laughs> i mean that shows uh, he was an oxfordian and he worked in singapore uh, under lee kuan yew uh, he was uh, one of the advisors to lee kuan yew's maritime economics how singapore to develop and see what has happened to singapore today and then he came as our um, trade and um, shipping minister to sri lanka under jaya jawadana and uh, he in 1981 or 2 donated 1 billion rupees out of his personal funds he was wealthy kid i mean otherwise you wouldn't have gone to oxford but today that fund has raised uh grown at up to 19 billion rupees i was told last and that sustains as a uh, minimum uh, cushion to some of these students who come from absolutely now i know as you said some students particularly some girl students who female students who come to our university save money from mahapola and send that money to their uh, family Uh, the mother is sick father is uh, unable to work or something like that and that's a condition so i am asking a full independent audit of the mahapola fund for last 10 years we need to tell mr late lalita tratmuli and his family what has happened to this fund i hear so many rumors about abuse and utterly misuse of this fund respective of the government officials the ministers who are involved we need a full independent maybe even international audit independent audit on this fund so that we know my i am in favor of increasing the mahapola particular dole that we give now grant that we give now because as you mentioned the inflation particularly food inflation in cities had increased so we need to sustain that uh, so let me may i meet you next I'll give you some information of how progress we have made and that's my uh, uh, plan for the now, moment minister you said that and this is uh, very well apparent that uh, the university system is somewhat being hijacked or being used or as a rallying ground for uh, political parties and you have expressed this uh, as well um what do you think what sort of an influence does political parties have on student unions and and, and student activism in, uh, in in the sri lankan university system and do you think it's a good thing or do you think it's a bad thing of course uh, your question should be located in context if you just take out of context it may now student politics is not a new thing in the world i mean there are golden eras of student politics uh, even in france germany england uh, those countries if you want to call them and then the other side of bangladesh india student politics had brought uh, many positive things to the society therefore student activism is a must it must continue but from 1980s students since the world change berlin wall collapsed and uh, those paradigmical um, ideological camps dissolved and disappeared almost students also changed their mode of engagement to context of engagement and particularly the style of engagement but unfortunately in sri lanka we have i don't know whether this, since we are a island nation this doesn't happen the student politics still is in the framework of 1960s and 70s so protest oppose violent and no discourse no answer just demands so i think in the modern world we understand that's not going much far i mean particularly last few months that sri lanka faced uh, one of the most transitional political uh, points in the aragale protest movement occupy movement but even then we did not see an intellectual discourse that is taking place student led it was more on symbolic and then finally it fell into the hands of the violence and then the violence side unfortunately now suspected is led by university student or the parties that are affiliated so i would appeal the reason for that is nearly about 30% of our professors and our academia are in favor of this kind of politics i do not know why 
Is it because their inability to change to the modern world so that they can be still safe as they are or they are 19th century ideology about society or Marxism or uh, some of those ideologies or even nationalism. So therefore, I appeal, I mean, through this, thank you for this question and this uh, opportunity. I appeal to all the uh, university students and teachers, academia, because in a country, the most educated gather in universities. And they are the forerunners, the engine of new thinking. They are the people who should provide answers to the contemporary as well as the futuristic, either real or imaginary challenges that we may have. And without doing that and being part of the positive, we cannot continue as universities. So I appeal to them, whatever the difficulties they may have, dialogue is the center of you know, higher education. Let's dialogue. How I am for university reform, I am for university freedom, I am for more investment, absolute, I think we should double the investment if possible. I am for that. But let's do it in more contemporary, valid way than on somebody's imaginary way of 19th century or even 16th century. There's a lot of um, academics, students, professionals, as well as citizens who have given their faith on you, uh, looking at your background as an academic, as well as uh, with yourself being a professor. So, um, as the Minister of Higher Education, so we've had so many Ministers of Higher Education before and uh, unfortunately we couldn't say all of them were qualified to handle this situation. And now we do have a Minister of, uh, State Minister of Higher Education who, ha who has the required qualifications as an academic to manage the situation. As the state minister, do you think that with, with, given, with, given, with given another uh, uh, proper adequate time frame, would you be able to carry out these reforms? Would you be able to do it? Uh, it's not a thank you for your good words on me. And I hope if I have given hope to uh, otherwise struggling society, I will be considering myself uh, a lucky person. Uh, this journey has not been easy. One other day, uh, I will have a coffee and discuss. I had gone to school in hunger in two shirts and one shoe. Rainy days when my shoe got wet, I didn't have an extra pair to wear and I borrowed shoes or I didn't go to school. And today I'm here and all my scholarships that I studied in Kent and my PhD and my post PhD from Oxford, then my research in Ottawa University, all were scholarships. It's simply because I did not have money, but I had to fight back. Uh, I feel life has a meaning in this way. Everything that happens to us, our life as an experience is asking and preparing us for something else. So I think those days had prepared me. I had been in universities. I have been a student. I have been a lecturer. I have been a policy maker. Um, therefore, those experiences should tell me, at least give me some adequate uh, in-depth understanding how we should have a dialogical um, reform framework. It's not just one man, one woman, one person's idea. We as a society must come together, need to ask what do we want actually from higher education? What do we mean by higher education? And what are these universities for? And that kind of, uh, some kind of ontological questions need to be asked after which we can go into how these universities should be reformed, which is more epistemological and more applied way of uh, managing higher education sector. Um, time, given time, I hope I'll get time and support from the academia and the political leadership to do these things because I strongly believe without reform in higher education, a society cannot lift itself from where it is. Higher education investment is the only futuristic investment that will cover an entire umbrella, entire range of that society's foundation to the roof. We really appreciate you coming to our show, Minister. My pleasure. State Minister of Higher Education, Dr. Suren Raghavan. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Rairu, for having me and uh, being able to share these few thoughts. And I hope um, this is 
this will pave the way um, for a better dialogue. And I request um, your viewers to feedback and tell us what you think. Um, we need uh, your thoughts because we, this is a team effort. And uh, thank you for supporting my thought process. We are looking forward to having the State Minister again in our show. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Uh, so, um, we'll... Cut. Yes, cut, cut it.